Today we're talking about a team of social rejects with superpowers who are led by a brilliant wheelchair bound man and it's not the X-Men. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome to Comic Misconceptions, a show that takes you into detail about the things you think you know about comics. I'm your host, Scott Nicewander, and I am just so excited for X-Men Days of Future Past coming out. I remember way back in the day seeing the very first X-Men movie with my dad in theaters, and I just remember thinking how cool that whole universe is of mutants, and ah, I love it. This is gonna be like the dumbest thing I've ever said on this show, but if you don't know who the X-Men are, then allow me to give you the Twitter rendition, 140 characters or less. The X-Men are a group of mutants, or people born with superpowers, who are often rejected by the general public as dangerous freaks. And I'm generalizing a lot here. I think it's just important to get a grasp of who the X-Men are before we start making comparisons. Now it's been said that X-Men is a straight ripoff of another comic that predates it, and I asked you guys last week if you knew what that comic book was, and Meg Gumble, along with many other people, said that it was Doom Patrol. And the best way to explain who Doom Patrol is, to those of you who don't know, is probably to compare it to the X-Men. Doom Patrol got its start in My Greatest Adventure number 80 from June of 1963. X-Men premiered in September of 1963, just three months later. They are both teams of the strangest heroes, led by a genius in a wheelchair who are feared and hated by the general public. They even occasionally fight an evil brotherhood. There are definitely some differences, especially when you dive into how each member of the team got their powers. X-Men get them naturally through genetics, whereas Doom Patrol gets them from various different accidents. Elastigirl got her powers of expanding and contracting her body from inhaling weird volcano fumes. Negative Man gained the ability to travel at the speed of light after being exposed to weird solar rays. Robot Man got his powers of being a robot by having every part of his body except his brain die in a car accident. Luckily, the chief, the leader of what would soon become Doom Patrol, was there to take that brain and put it inside a robot body using his genius level intellect. I mean, later it was revealed that the chief was actually a crazy person who had orchestrated the events that caused each member of the team to have their powers, turning them into social outcasts and ruining their already fantastic lives just so he could explore his philosophy of greatness through tragedy, but you know, thanks anyway. Plus, the Chief is supposed to be the Professor X of Doom Patrol, but he doesn't exactly look like Patrick Stewart, right? Oh, he kinda does the... yeah. It's actually the original members of Doom Patrol and their roles on the team that make people think that Doom Patrol itself could actually be a ripoff of Fantastic Four, which premiered in 1961, two years earlier. Now, this one isn't as convincing as the X-Men one is to me, but... I'll let you make your own decision after I lay out all the facts. So let's run through the original members of each group. Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four can stretch and contract his body much like Elastigirl from Doom Patrol. Human Torch from Fantastic Four can fly and in doing so is completely engulfed in flames much like how Negative Man from Doom Patrol can fly while being a manifestation of pure energy. Fantastic Four's The Thing is a powerful orange beast who resented his powers at first for disfiguring him past the point of looking human, like how Doom Patrol's Robot Man is a powerful orange robot who misses his human days as well. Pretty good so far, I'm on board, but this last one is a bit of a stretch. Invisible Woman from Fantastic Four is just that, invisible, much like how Chief from Doom Patrol stays out of sight during the battles because he's just a guy that runs things from behind the scenes. I'm gonna put a link in the description for an article that goes over this in more detail, including a comparison to Stan Lee's original Fantastic Four draft that is surprisingly dark. I really encourage you guys to check it out right down there. But we're talking about the X-Men here, and, and especially when talking about ripoffs, there's one big thing, this one big factor in all of this that tends to be overlooked and that is the timeline. And I know what you're thinking. But Scott, yes, we already talked about how X-Men premiered just three months after Doom Patrol. Exactly. It takes a while to create a comic book and three months is kind of stretching it thin to get everything done. To put it in perspective, I'm sure that you've seen how it seems like there's always a pair of identical movies that come out each year, like, for example, some of these in recent years. These are called twin movies, and a lot of time, it's not one person blatantly ripping off the other person's work. You have to remember that, especially in movies, all the people that make the movies live in this kind of general area, and it's very possible and very probable that they could just be influenced by the very same stimuli as someone else at the exact same time. Just think of the surge of Sherlock Holmes TV shows and movies that happened within the past decade. All of them just felt like it was time to bring that character back, but none of them were directly trying to rip off another 
person's work, except Elementary, that is 100% a ripoff link in the description. It's hard to say whether Marvel directly and purposefully stole the idea for X-Men from Doom Patrol, given that the time frame was so close together, but Arnold Drake, one of the creators of Doom Patrol, had this explanation to offer. Over the years, I learned that an awful lot of writers and artists were working surreptitiously between two offices, Marvel and DC. Therefore, from when I first brought the idea to the DC editor Murray Boltonov's office, it would have been easy for someone to walk over and hear that this guy Drake is working on a story about a bunch of reluctant superheroes who are led by a man in a wheelchair. So over the years, I began to feel that Stan had more lead time than I realized. He may have had four, five, or even six months. I'm interested to know what you guys think. Was X-Men a ripoff of Doom Patrol? Was Doom Patrol a ripoff of Fantastic Four? Or was all of this just an example of parallel thinking and crazy coincidences? Let me know in the comments. If you leave some good thoughts and feedback, I will feature them on the show next week and address them the best that I can. But now, let's move on to the weekly trivia challenge. So I've been bouncing back and forth between different topics for a while, and I feel like I definitely want to do an episode that's more helpful than just random trivia, although I do live for random trivia. So you may have heard that comic books have different ages to them, like Golden Age, Silver Age, and so on, and each one is very important and has a very interesting history behind them that shapes and molds comic books and the industry to how we know it today. And I cannot wait to share it with all of you guys, starting with this week's trivia challenge, which is, what is widely cited as the event that ended the Silver Age of comic books? If you know the answer or just wanna leave your best guess, you can do so in the comments below. And if you are right, I could feature you on the show next week. So get started on this week's trivia challenge. First of all, a huge thank you to all of you guys. We just passed 2,000 subscribers on YouTube and we cannot, literally cannot do it without you, obviously, but also your involvement in the show makes this whole thing worthwhile and I appreciate it so much. So thank you so much for, I can't say thank you as, as much as I want to, but thanks. With that said, I might not understand cars, but that's not gonna stop me from making my own Scottmobile. Let's see what you guys had to say about last week's episode and comic book vehicles. Tim O'Brien brings up Lois Lane's bubble car, which I had not heard of, but it's definitely up there on the weirdness scale. Miles Vincent leaves a comment about the Spider-Man Megazord from a Japanese TV show. I mean, just look at this thing. Ah, it's so weird and goofy, but it's awesome. If you want to check out the whole video, link is in the description. Sligothor 12 reminds us that the Spider-Mobile's journey does not end when Spider-Man returns it to the advertising company and in fact makes an appearance in a story arc called Old Man Logan. Now, I'm going to add this to the source material for that last episode and also down in the description below as well. It's a wonderful story arc and it's just having the Spider-Mobile there adds another layer of awesomeness. This. Comment of the week has to go to Martin Schlummer, who tells us all sorts of awesome information about two of the cars that I mentioned last week, including how the Supermobile was really just created 100% because of a toy deal by a toy car manufacturer, Corgi. Uh, but the Spider-Mobile also had that same kind of deal, but it wasn't even released in real life by Corgi until a couple years after the comic book. And uh, there was a Mego Spider-Man mobile that looks far from the counter uh, part in the comic book. So just go check it all out. Link in the description. You can't stop me from putting more links there because I want to and I like learning. And remember to check out our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. We also did a Flash TV trailer breakdown of the five minute long trailer. We broke it down into like 30 minutes plus of just fun stuff. So go check that out. Uh, I'll put the video up at the end. And also, you guys, if this is your first time hanging out with us, please do subscribe. We love hanging out with you. And if you have any topics for other future episodes of the show, please leave them in the comments below. You guys are what keeps this show running. So I'm Scott once more, and we'll see you right here next week for more things that you thought you knew about comics. See ya. Oh, Batman, you do have a cornucopia of bat-themed vehicles and gliders and such, but one of the worst ones has to be the Whirly Bat. In Detective Comics number 257, Batman and Robin are battling some random villain with a giant tentacle robot and it throws the Batmobile against a brick wall, rendering it useless for the rest of the battle. Luckily, Batman was prepared for this and he had a pair of Whirly Bats in the trunk of the Batmobile just in case. Basically, it's just a minimal 